So thank you for joining. And I'm very pleased to have such a, uh, a lot of people uh, come. And my name is Tomoko Kode, a visiting scholar at the Department of Linguistics. And in my talk, I'll talk about what I did during uh, my wonderful sabbatical study here. And the title is An Adult Immigrant's Chronotopic Identities, Language Play in Classroom Interactions. Okay, well, first of all, let me talk about what motivated me to study language learning of low literate adult immigrants with limited schooling. Uh, looking back at my research history, my research interests revolved, revolved around uh, these different but connected theoretical constructs. And, uh, but my target population was always EFL learners with low proficiency who had been left behind in school education in Japan. And I read Lourdes Ortega's papers, Lourdes Ortega, <laughs> uh, and uh, where she stresses that the mainstream, mainstream SLA research disproportionately studied weird populations, that is Western educated, industrial, rich, and democratic population. And she said that the uh, marginalized populations are underexplored. I was attracted by her statement. And in 2016, I attended AAAL and encountered Sarah, Young, uh, Sarah Young's paper, paper presentation. This is uh, Sarah Young knows. Uh, she's, <laughs> she's here, thank you. And, and uh, Sarah Young was the former uh, Lotus PhD student at that time. And her presentation was a sociocognitive perspective on metalinguistic awareness, case studies of four low literate learners. At that time, I had not known anything about low literate migrant adults, but I found some similarities between these two populations. So this is why I came to study at Georgetown University. And through the course project of SLA and bilingualism of Lourdes Ortega, I got interested in language play. And I also sat Professor Anna Dufina's uh, class discourse, identity, and narrative course. And I learned that um, identity is a very important notion, particularly for marginalized populations. So in today's uh, talk, I will connect these two constructs. Okay, first let me talk about Davila 2019, which showed language play as a site for identity negotiation. The participants of the study were French-speaking multilingual immigrant high school students who had come to the United States from Democratic of Congo and Cameroon. And data was collected from group work interactions in classes of English as a second language. A number of humorous translingual practices uh, like playing with accents and storytelling were observed. And they illustrated the participants' identities as French-speaking -spe Africans within a predominantly white African-American and Latino student body. And so Davila concluded that the everyday playful classroom interactions afforded the students opportunities to negotiate macro processes of social, racial, and economic marginalization in and outside of, the, of school. Okay, uh, what is a language play? Um, Taron defines it as a use of language that is not 
primarily transactional, but rather ludic in function. So uh, the langu language whose purpose is not primarily to transmit information, but rather to entertain. And another definition is that the interactional practices in which language is being played with or is being used to make playful comments. So as shown in this definition, uh, the play, uh, language play is conceptualized in two ways. Play with language or cook, in the cook's term, it is a formal language play. And the other one is play in language or semantic language play. So I'll elabor elaborate each of these, uh, these plays uh, with examples. Okay, well, uh, first, uh, play with language is equivalent to word play where language itself is manipulated as the object of play. So it includes rhyming, alliteration, like best buy, people, piper picked something, and parallelism, like father, like son, and so on. And this is an example of rhyming. And child one says, hey, child two says, mother, Mia, laugh, mother, smear, laugh. And I said, mother, smear, mother, near, mother, tear, mother, dear. So uh, Mia, smear, near, uh, so these uh, are rhyming with each other. So we can observe this kind of manipulation in child language use. And next one is play in language. Well, play in language refers to playful remarks uh, like teasing or irony in which language users play with units of meaning, combining them in ways that create a fictitious or non-ordinary discourse. So uh, in this case, language is a medium of play for amusing purposes. Okay, this is an example of double voicing cited from Tarong. And these children uh, are talking about what Brandon did, um, but Brandon was not there. So because this, uh, this conversation, most of the conversation is, uh, is Spanish. So I want to ask Laudes to read these lines and I will read the English translation. All right. Este es que Brandon hizo. This is what Brandon did. Él estaba en el computador y so, mira como este, and, and, and. He was on the computer, he did. Look at this, and, and, and. Sí, un montículo. Yes, a mound. Oh, I was like and, Brandon, and he's. No es mi culpa que uso mi dedo medio para mí. It's not my fault, I use my middle finger for myself. Okay, so uh, this, is, this talk is about what Brandon did, but this is not a mere report of what happened. And particularly, these reported speeches may not be the exact copy of what Brandon said. Rather, the two children dramatized the previous conversation, this one, uh, with their own point of view, as an overtone. So here, a, a fictitious world is created. Okay, so in this talk, I'll focus on this play in language. Well, uh, so let's delve into the nature of play in language. Since play creates a fictional world, uh, language, language play can be regarded as a stepping out of real life. Gordon states that play is a lamination of play frame and work frame, stressing the paradoxical and ambiguous nature of play. In, in other words, 
the nature of not being serious overlaps with being serious. And so the play frame permits people to inhabit two worlds at once. Therefore, in ludic language play, a speaker manipulates language for his, own, his, his or her own emotional amusement, for irony, or for other purposes, exploiting an interplay among their complex identities. Well, the notion of chronotope seems to align well with language play. Chronotope is originally uh, Bafting's, uh, Bafting's notion on literacy genres. It refers to the intrinsic connectedness of temporal and spatial relationships uh, that are artistically expressed in literature. Given that chronotopes are connected to specific forms of agency and identity, changes in time-space configurations trigger complex shifts in cultural practices and identity construction. Imagine you have a drink at a pub with your colleagues after the office hour. In that case, a shift from the office hour chronotope to happy hour at pub chronotope will take place. And uh, your competent worker persona in the office hour will turn into an incompetent drinker persona. Mm -hmm. So the notion of chronotope is used as a key, key tool for the analysis of identity work. And Blomert and Dufina show an interesting example of classroom chronotopes. They analyzed a super diverse elementary school classroom in Sicily. And they found a variety of chronotopes coexisted. Well, the official classroom was structured with a teacher dominant discourse like initiation, response, and follow up sequences. But in that classroom, an unofficial uh, type of chronotopes. Uh, such as fighting occasionally appeared from the back region. See, uh, Nino said, this is my pencil, I was drawing with, with it. So they were fighting. And so Nino said this line in Sicilian dialect, which was not uh, official language in this classroom. And then uh, Ma Manlio screamed to the teacher in Italian, that is, the, uh, which was the official language in the classroom. And teacher, can you tell into, uh, Nino to give me that pencil? And so here, the, the, this um, Mandio uh, intruded in, uh, into the front region from the back region. And Nin, Nino said, oh, Mario, stop it, go away. Again, this is in Sicilian direct. Fuck you. So this example illustrates that the official identity as a student in the class chronotope and the unofficial identity as a true man in the back region chronotope are negotiating with each other. Uh, this is not an example of language play, but we can apply this framework to the analysis of spontaneous language play in the classroom. As Sullivan states that spontaneous language play in classrooms is often viewed as a distractor not being on task. Unofficial play in language occasionally intrudes into the classroom discourse. Then we can see dynamic nature of identities within a traditional structured classroom discourse. Well, in the book titled Spontaneous Play in Language Classroom, Hans stresses that the language classroom is a living cultural entity where identities are negotiated. And 
uh, language play helps to create social bonds and uh, leading to the building of community of practice. And, uh, and a group identity is formed in that community of practice. Han also stresses the social nature of language play. In an interactional context, if only the play instigator recognizes the play frame and the other participants do not understand it, there is no play. So uh, the research side of the project was a community-based print literacy program for adults in an urban area in the United States. I video recorded 12 hours of teacher-learner classroom interactions from uh, January to early March. The participants were one teacher and three adult learners. 11 language play episodes were collected, identified. And among the, the, the three adult learners, Lily was an active performer of play in language rather than play with language. So Lily is the focal participant of this study. Okay, so uh, the research questions are, what kinds of space-time personal connections do Lily's language plays involve? Two, how are her identities conveyed to and shared with the other participants? The table summarizes the demographic information of the participants. Zach was from uh, Tanzania and Hannah was from Thailand and Lily was from Sierra Leone. Uh, the focal participant Lily had received no formal education. So she had very limited print literacy in any language. According to an informal interview, she said she had to work from her childhood to help her blind mother. She worked hard to Sierra Leone to send her daughter to college in the United States. She has lived with her daughter's family since she arrived in the United States in 2011. Her daughter Patumata is a nurse and Lily has no job. And please note that the one of her first languages was Creole, an English-based Creole. Mm. As I said earlier, uh, I video recorded naturally occurring classroom inter interactions, usually from this position. So Zach, Lily, Hannah, and the teacher. And instruction at this literacy program program was direct and explicit teaching of the sound letter correspondences. So using these alphabetic cards, they practiced decoding words like mm, uh, mat. Well, uh, while practicing word decoding, Lily sometimes performs off-task play in language. These are uh, three language play episodes identified in Lily's speech. I analyzed two episodes named Freetown episode and By Yourself episode. Both of them seemed to reflect Lily's daily lives. Well, well before, show, uh, uh, before showing you each of the language play episodes, I need to mention Bamberg's po positioning analysis that I employ to analyze space-time personal configurations. Uh, this positioning analysis is a narrative analysis model and identities are seen at three levels. The level one analysis examines how the characters are positioned in relation to one another within the story world. In my study, uh, within the play chronotope. Level two looks at 
how the speaker or narrator positions him or herself to the audience within the storytelling world, in my study, within the class chronotope. And level three is concerned with the more generalized level. So how the speaker positions a sense of self beyond the local conversational situation. And in my study, after identifying the space and the time in the language play episode, the first two levels, two levels of, of positioning analysis were employed. Okay, let me describe the um, Freetown episode. Before the language play occurred, they had discussed the meaning of the word skill. So teacher said, what does skill mean? Skill. What's your skill? Can you cook? And Lily answered, uh, my skill, uh, school? My skill, prayer? And she laughed. Yeah, yeah. And to Hannah, what are you good at? Cooking? Hannah said, cooking. Uh, teaching is my skill. I like it and I'm good at it. And the teacher replaced the K card in skill with P card uh, to make the uh, word spill, the next word to practice. But Lily said, my skill cooking, prayer, business, my home long time ago, business, yes. And she started to chant prayers, prayer, Pokoko da 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 mori modo da da ka ka ka, like this. So I identified this as the beginning of the language play because of her dramatization and exaggeration and her creation of an imaginary world. And here, uh, the chronotype of Freetown, where she lived in the past, mm, was created. Mm. Well, Lily was chanting a prayer. Mm. The teacher pointed to the uh, pointed to the spill cards and nominated Zach to read it. So here, the class chronotype and the Freetown chronotype coexisted. And after uh, laughing and clapping. Lily got back to the class chronotope and practiced decoding the word. So, sp, spin, spit, so, And then, uh, after uh, several turns, the teacher attempted to move on to the next class activity, saying, this is yours, this is yours. She, she passed some cards to each student. But, Lily interrupted her and began to tell her a story. Uh, I do business na parliament, I go by. Okay, so Lily obtained the floor and kept telling her story in Creole-like idiolect. So this is the English translation, I'll read it. I do business at parliament, I, I, go, I, I go by drum. But the Chinese there, the policemen there, because they need bad men, uh, then they call the, um, the women around them call the policemen, then they come, took my load, then then flew up on 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 the truck. So I go to call the the, the. then Zach asked, still? Mm. But uh, she continued, Chinese man who sold me this thing, come say, no. Uh, no way, this, this woman not Alibaba. So Chinese man, thief man, no Alibaba. So the gist of the story was that while she was doing business in Freetown, uh, something happened. Uh, I, I, uh, that, that part was not clear to me. But anyway, the policeman su suspected that she was a thief and they came and try to take, take her load on the truck. Then Lily uh, went to the Chinese merchant who sold her 
uh, goods. And, and she asked him to testify her innocence. And the Chinese man came and said for her, uh, no, this woman is not Alibaba, meaning uh, this woman is not a thief. Okay. But the other participants did not understand what she wanted to say by the word Alibaba. Alibaba? Yes, Alibaba. I don't know Alibaba. What does that mean, Alibaba? Tihman, Tihman. Oh, okay. I don't know Alibaba. Alibaba, Chinese Alibaba. Tihman, Alibaba. So, I don't know. Chinese man say me, 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 are not Alibaba, not thief man. I don't know. And finally, the teacher understood the meaning. Oh, he said not a thief. Oh, okay, so Alibaba steals, okay. Oh, interesting. Okay, to analyze the identity projected in this free uh, time space, uh, episode, I employ the first two levels of Bumble's positioning analysis. The first level of the positioning analysis examines positioning of the characters within the free town chronotope. First, I looked at the power relationship among the characters. The main characters were Lily, the policeman, and the Chinese man. And it was obvious that the policeman was more uh, authoritative and more powerful than Lily as a working woman. The Chinese man was positioned as her ally. Then I looked at her language usage, particularly the semantic relations between the pronoun subjects and their verbs. I which refers to Lily, uh, was always the agent of the verbs, like I do, I go, uh, or I buy, I call. And on the other hand, uh, they, which refers to the policeman, was also the agent. They come, they took. And interestingly, Lily was, uh, was not uh, the patient of the policeman's action. So we can say that the pro protagonist Lily was positioned as an agentive woman coping with difficulties imposed by the authority. So here are the, uh, the um, agency of the, the two parties uh, conflicting against each other. Okay. Uh, next, uh, I also did the level two analysis where Lily's positioning vis-a-vis -vis the audience in the classroom was examined. I compare the two chronotopes in terms of the way Lily interacted with the other participants. Well, she concentrated on careful pronunciation of short words in the teacher-controlled discourse. She she, uh, oh, so, sorry. Uh, she produced a stretch of her vernacular speech with exaggerated gestures like this. And also, please note that they discussed the meaning of skill before the language play took place. Therefore, she may have wanted to express her skillfulness, liveliness, and greatness. Uh, research question two was concerned with the way her identity is shared with the other participants. This is the email from the teacher written on the next day of the class. Uh, my eventual understanding of her story was as follows. Lily was uh, telling, telling everyone how good or skilled she is in business. She's so good that one time she had purchased a whole truckload of something from a Chinese merchant in Freetown. Blah, blah, blah. And so uh, we can see that teacher understood Lily's positioning very well. On the other hand, 
I found no evidence that Zach and Hannah were invited into the Freetown chronotope. But there were a few occasions when Zach and Hannah requested for clarification. Uh, Zach asked still, and Hannah also expressed her failures to understand the meaning of Alibaba. But despite their requests, there were no chances of clarifications. Okay, let's move on to the next episode, by yourself episode. Uh, immediately before the language play occurred, Lily was doing the decoding practice of debit credit pair using these, uh, these cards. Mm, so uh, she, when she tried to read credit, she said, K -k and uh, af so after a lot of efforts uh, to decode these words with, uh, with the teacher's sc scaffolding and Zach's help, uh, finally, uh, the, this debit credit pair made sense for her. So she says, this credit, this debit. And yeah, oh God, is this great? Great. So she looked very happy. Then the teacher said, remember, you have to take a part of the words so you can read each, uh, each piece by itself. So this by itself seems to trigger uh, Lily's next word. She suddenly said in a loud voice, by yourself, Patumata. At first, I classified it as play with language, namely the manipulation of the uh, linguistic form by oneself. But be because the addressee Patumata was her daughter, who was not uh, in the classroom, clearly Lily created a fictitious world. Mm. So uh, she said that do it, do it by yourself, Patumata. Mm. Thus, I, so I, cut, I recategorized it as play in language, semantic language play. And the imagined space was her home. In other words, she was in the home chronotope. Mm. After that, she suddenly turned to me and said, Professor, by yourself, Tomoko, by yourself. By saying so, she invited me uh, to her chronotopic world. Okay, let me do positioning analysis as I did for Freetown Chronotope. For level one, uh, I looked at the power relationships. Within the chronotope, Lily was positioned as an author authoritative mother, while Pat Patumata was a dependent daughter. It makes a sharp contrast with her positioning in the reality. In this country, Lily lives with Patumata uh, and Patumata's family, that is her son-in-law and grandchildren. So it is likely that Lily is less powerful than Patumata as an educated nurse. Another interesting thing was the term of address toward me. She said, professor by yourself, she had never addressed me with professor. This is the only time she used this word. So here, uh, the, another power reversal occurred. So together with these uh, two power reversals, it seems that Lily positioned herself as an authoritative adult who put emphasis on independence. To analyze her positioning vis-a-vis -vis the audience in the classroom, I looked at her gaze. So these green uh, highlights show her gaze at the teacher. In the decoding practice, she frequently looked at the teacher, particularly 
at the end of her term, eat, and look at the teacher. Mm. This indicates her heavy reliance on the teacher's evaluation. In contrast, in the By Yourself episode, Lily never look at the teacher or Zach at all. More interestingly, she gazed, uh, she, looked, uh, she looked at the uh, credit debit cards while saying by yourself, but to matter. So here, this, uh, so by yourself, but to matter implies the uh, home chronotope, but her gaze shows she was in the uh, classroom chronotope. So this seems to indicate that the home chronotope and the class chronotope were laminated. Therefore, I would say that uh, Lily positioned herself as an independent decoder of English words. To examine the research question two regarding whether her identities were conveyed to the other participants, I looked at the teacher's reaction. Uh, the teacher said after her language play, you've got it, yeah. You don't, so I want you, you don't need me here, right? I want you to be able to do by yourself. So uh, te the teacher obviously understood Lily's positioning as an independent decoder. However, again, there was no evidence of Zach's understanding of her language play. So these are my, uh, the answers to the research questions. Mm. Lily positioned herself as an agentive adult coping with difficulties, including language problems in social marginalization. And the teacher understood Lily's agency expressed in her language plays. It was unlikely, however, that the other participants, Zach and Hannah, fully enjoyed the language plays and sympathized with the identities expressed in them. Well, let's get back to this previous slide. Though Lily performed the language plays, the audience, other than the teacher, failed to understand her. With some facilitation, the other participants could enjoy the play together and form the community of practice. So now I'd like to discuss pedagogical implication. Coriander and, and Anderson dis, uh, discuss different approaches to teaching initial adult literacy. The traditional one is cognitive and individual approach, in which the focus is on word recognition, phonics, for, and phonemic awareness. And print literacy is considered to be a skill. Uh, and, uh, and the authors uh, state that the limiting the print literacy to only to a skill entails a risk of uh, deficiency view. And, uh, and, and so uh, they, they says that the more wide, uh, sorry, a wider approach is necessary. That is sociocultural and critical approach. Uh, so in this view, uh, print literacy is re regarded as more than a skill. The learners are viewed as adults who bring their backgrounds, values, and experiences to the literacy practice. And in the critical approach, the teachers should support the adult learners in developing social awareness for social change. So my image of the relationships between the two approaches is like this. So cognitive approach and sociocultural and critical approach. And uh, I, I suggest that the, for the pedagogical implication, uh, the class uh, start with storytelling. And in, the, in that storytelling, 
language play may spontaneously take place and identity negotiation will also uh, take place. And, uh, and also social awareness will be raised. And in that, uh, on the, on, in, in this kind of, uh, well, uh, community of practice, uh, cognitive literacy skills will be promoted. Mm -hmm. So I would say uh, language play is a potential meaning making site for projecting adult immigrants complex identities. And this will contribute to their empowerment. As a final remark, um, I would like to express my gratitude to Professor Lourdes Ortega. And looking back at myself at the time of arrival here in DC, my research scope was quite narrow. Through having such a wonderful interactions with Lourdes and all people associated uh, in, with Georgetown University, my resources uh, expanded and became rich. So thank you very much. And these are uh, the references. And uh, lastly, oh, <laughs> lastly, uh, the, for the, uh, the world is facing unprecedented problems. So I'd like to conclude my talk by reciting Martin Luther King Jr.'s word uh, we may have all come on different ships, but we are in the same boat now. Thank you very much. <laughs>